So the Echonomy project has left uh, its funded phase. It's still existing and it's still operating uh, because the consortium, it by and large, sticks together and, and is following up, uh, uh, even in, in, in projects that are a result or that have been triggered and that have been prepared by Echonomy. So it's still alive. Um, what was Echonomy all about? The Echonomy was about establishing a mechanism-based taxonomy for neurodegenerative diseases, which is something like a very, very ambitious thing if you consider that uh, neurodegenerative diseases are generally considered to be idiopathic diseases. That means somehow uh, nobody has a clue what the real etiology is and the underlying mechanisms are unknown. And, and we are about to stratify or to classify um, the t syndromes that Parkinsonism and Alzheimerism are in reality, they are rather syndromes than individual diseases, um, based on mechanisms. So, so you could call that a kamikaze mission, <laughs> if you want. It was quite, quite crazy. So what, what, what does it mean, or what was the aim? We want to stratify patients who suffer from Parkinsonism or Alzheimerism <laughs> according to their individual pathophysiology mechanisms or combinations thereof. And that's, the idea is here in the cartoon, because you know we, we, we are always good in understanding cartoons. Does this work? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a mixed population, typically. And when you do post-mortem auto autopsy, you, you actually find a lot of mixture and mixed pathologies and, and, and everything, so the entire spectrum. And the belief is, or the assumption is, that there are actually uh, subgroups, identifiable subgroups. The brain here is just a, a symbol for uh, subgrouping with maybe different brain regions or b different cell types, different processes, as Angela just outlined, you know, this neuroinflammatory context uh, could be highly specific for certain groups. And we learned about, you know, some TREM levels have predictive value for the progression the speed of progression. So we know already, we have a lot of evidences that there are subgroups. And the idea, of course, is, and that's the uh, precision medicine paradigm, that once you understand the, the strata, you can develop much more tailored uh, therapeutic approaches. <coughs> so the anti-idea of mechanism-based taxonomy actually makes a lot of sense, but, but neurodegeneration is the most challenging domain to apply to. The reality is, um, first of all, 30 years of Alzheimer and Parkinson research have not come up with that taxonomy and any hint that this would be an easy job to do. Um, we were not so self-confident that we thought that we could do the job that 30 years of you know, combined intelligence of other, all the others in the world uh, didn't, didn't tackle. This is one thing. The, the, the point is that when we really look at the domain, um, there's data and knowledge on the pathophysiology mechanisms, which is uh, very much biased. You know, we all, a lot of people just look at the, at the uh, amyloid cascade and tau. Uh, the, the, the knowledge is scattered. It's very heterogeneous because it partially comes from mice and from uh, genetically engineered mice and, and then uh, post-mortem observations, but we have no clue what happens in between, you know, the, on, the earliest mechanistic onset of the disease and, and the death of the person, the patient, and sometimes it's simply wrong um, because people measure with inadequate assays and so on. So the, the knowledge and the data we have is scattered, is diverse, is heterogeneous, it's multimodal. It, it, it stretches from the molecular level to the population level and things like uh, lifestyle, sports and stress and so on, exposure play a role. So if you want to tackle that problem <laughs> to generate a mechanism-based taxonomy of neurodegenerative diseases, you obviously have quite a big challenge in front of you. And the original concept that we thought of was, uh, let's do two different things. One is generate an overview on all the mechanism hypotheses that are out there. And if you, we talk about mechanism hypotheses, we could call them pathophysiology graphs or pathways, which are also graphs, or even biomarkers. This is not fully synonymous, these terms, but, but they are related. And then we develop methods that test on patient-level data, 
where the patient subgroups can be associated with these mechanisms. That's one thing. So you need an overview on mechanisms on one side. And the other thing is you need the methodology. And we thought initially on about a, a method that is called clustering. It belongs to the unsupervised learning, machine learning um, types of methods. And this clustering shows patterns, and the patterns should be associated with pathway or mechanisms. And then we have an indication for a strata, for a patient subgroup. So what we need is just the collection or the inventory of uh, pathophysiology mechanisms that can be tested, should be testable uh, mechanisms. So they need to be, to a certain extent, computable. And, uh, and we need to validate. Because uh, if you find a pattern in one set of patient level data, it needs to be validated in an independent data set. Yeah? So we need a comprehensive collection of available patient level data sets. And there's a huge difference between data sets that are official, that are declared to be available and that are really uh, available. So, so there's a lot of data sets where people say you can have that, but if you really want to work with it, then things sometimes start to become difficult. So one of the uh, data sets that you will never get into your hands is the Rotterdam cohort data that Adapted was working with. And even within the Adapted consortium, some people were not allowed to work with the Rotterdam cohort data. So um, from my perspective, the Rotterdam cohort doesn't even exist <laughs> because uh, reproducibility and independent validation is a principle in our domain. And if I cannot work with the data, for me, the data doesn't exist. I wouldn't fund anything in that. Oh. <clears throat> so, uh, so that's a question for later. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ways, I, I already mentioned, we need ways and methods to associate pathophysiology mechanisms with the variables in clinical studies. And that's also quite a problem, because what we know on the mechanism side is, is containing variables that are not measured in the clinic. And what we measure in the clinic is not easily related to what we know about uh, molecular mechanisms, for instance. One of the links are these biomarkers, you know, the TREM and the, the uh, A-beta and the tau and so on of this world. But it's a very limited set. It's a sort of bottleneck in the linkage between the clinical world and the underlying mechanism world. Yeah, and we need well-powered independent data sets for validation. That was uh, another challenge. What did we do? We didn't go for either a purely data-driven or purely knowledge-driven approach. We actually combined it. We did both. We did a knowledge-driven approach, which resulted in the biggest inventory of um, computable mechanism hypothesis on Alzheimer and Parkinson. Alzheimerism and Parkinsonism, and, uh, and we did a lot of data-driven approaches, including uh, the clustering uh, uh, experiments and Bayesian network modeling of longitudinal um, clinical data. Let me just guide you through what we did to, to establish this, uh, this inventory of, uh, of candidate mechanisms in a computable form. So computable means that we turn expressions like this here, protein increase A increases protein B, leading to an increase in calcium efflux, for instance, that we turn that into a computable representation. This is a symbolic representation. And we call these little things that um, say, for instance, protein A leads to the generation of amyloid plaques. A induces plaque here. We call that a triple. Triples are nice because they can form graphs. So if you assemble a lot of and glue a lot of statements together, triples together, that contain causal relationships, you actually build quite substantial graphs. And that could be, for instance, the graph representing part of the entire amyloid cascade. And this is what we did to an, in an unparalleled fashion, because we did it for all the literature that's out there, or well, everything that's that's being said and published about Alzheimer, we have essentially mined. And we came up with a set of graphs representing a set of mechanism hypotheses. For Alzheimer, we have 126 of these graphs. And they, these graphs are special. They are not pathways in the classical sense, because they 
they go across scales. So they reach from a genome SNP level up to a uh, epidemiological level or an imaging level, clinical level. So they reach really from a genetic level, via biological processes, cell types, and so on, up to, okay, there it is, to cognition tests and images. You have in the graph model, you have readouts that are um, essentially spanning from genetics to neuroimaging and um, population data. And this is growing, this knowledge base, not going into any detail, it's still growing and still being uh, expanded. We have 126 of these nice graphs, computable graphs, because they are in a standardized syntax, they are standardized representation format. We have 76 for Parkinson's, 31 for epilepsy. We have done, together with a uh, uh, charity in the US, we have done that all for PTSD and TBI, which are slightly related. They are high-resolution, disease-specific pathophysiology graphs. They are much better, and we have shown that, and there's a paper submitted on that, than the standard pathway databases. And they can be queried, for instance, by genetics or by imaging results. Yeah? Good. And you can do with the server we have built, and it's publicly available. Everybody can use that here in the room. If you want to, just search for NeuroMSIC and uh, upload some, some data that you are interested in we can actually associate clinical data and stages with mechanisms. And that was one of the earliest things we did. And forget that analysis, it's not half as good as the stuff that we are currently doing. But that was the first shot, so to speak. It's published by Charlie Hoyt in, in, in the database journal. So as a brief summary on this part, we have generated the largest inventory of disease mechanisms on neurodegenerative diseases worldwide. This is a major outcome of economy. They are in a computable form. They are reusable. They can be read and understood and used by computers as much as by humans. Um, they are multi-scale and multimodal, and uh, we make them freely available. And the current re revision of the server aims at allowing you to send your clinical data set to that server and you get back your strata, your, your patient strata. That is our vision. Um, I skip this here because that is just the reality of patient level data and that <laughs> leads to, <laughs> yeah, that leads to, uh, maybe I should just briefly mention, this is what everybody in our Alzheimer d domain uh, takes as the categorical imperative of Alzheimer. Uh, yeah, so it's awful. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. But I think I, I've learned that Clifford Jack himself says this is, you know, yeah. it is not appropriate anymore. But anyway, this is this cartoon is shown on each Alzheimer conference at, at least once, and uh, and it is a cartoon. And we have turned that cartoon into a computable form. We have back translated it into numbers. And then we were running the reality here of, of the ADNI data, for instance, of longitudinal uh, patient-specific data. And you see how messy they, these data are. Yeah? This is not a clear picture that emerges. This is not a clear regression you know, line that you can plot here. This is, this is awful. <laughs> this, is, this is real life in, in data science. And, and what we were doing, and I skipped through this, we were essentially now enabling to compare the cartoon in the computable form with the trajectories, the biomarker trajectories in, in major longitudinal studies. Um, that is just understanding um, the reality and understanding the biomarker trajectories. And we are going to do that with the EPAD data as well, and we do a lot of comparative modeling now. We compare what Craig in this wonderful EPAD project has produced with the entire consortium. Uh, to the other referential studies, and just with the idea in mind to improve our understanding what we can generalize and what we can't generalize, you know? Um, by the way, the, the, the models that we generate from these longitudinal patient-specific data are also models that are computable. They are shareable, and we are giving them away openly, and we, we hope that people will reuse them. So, um, one thing that I want to say about patient data and clinical data in, in principle, um, 
is if you if you if you think of it, you hear of a study, and you typically think, yeah, they people measured genotypes and clinical data and MRI and gene expression and proteomics for all the people in the study, but that's not true. What you see here is actually, I think, the um, at Neuromed uh, numbers, or the ADNI, one of those, sorry, um, I, I have to look that up, but you see that you have 1,719, so it must be ADNI, uh, 1,719 um, uh, people in the, in, the, in the study, and it's clinical data you have for almost all of them, but you don't have MRI for all of them, and you don't have the genotyping for all of them, and there's just 231 out in this study that have for all the modalities data in their data set, yeah? And that's the reality. So we, have, we when I said initially everything is scattered and, and uh, heterogeneous and so on, this is illustrating how scattered. And I think EPAT has, has set new um, uh, standards for completeness here. Um, and that's a comparison between at Neuromed, Adney, and the Eibel study from Australia, just to tell you how, how heterogeneous we are on the variable side. So this is the question, how, how good is the overlap when you look at the readouts, the variables that have been measured between those studies? And you see that they cannot be easily compared. So studying Alzheimer and studying Alzheimer can mean two different things, even if you work with at patient level data. Good, and then we went for um, new algorithms and did a new approach, which is a bit more advanced, I would say, than ranking algorithms, uh, as we have heard them about them uh, in the first talk. Um, and it's essentially um, tackling two problems. One is tackling mechanism or patterns over time in longitudinal data, and it's the the old problem that I already mentioned, that um, you, have, you have knowledge about causes and effects in, in these uh, um, bell graphs, in these mechanism graphs, but they do not easily map onto the clinical data. And we have developed methodology to build better bridges between the mechanism graphs and the clinical data. Mm -hmm. And one of the bridges is genetics, but there's also the more imaging features we can use, we can use imaging as a bridge, or lipidomics, or, or proteomics, and so on. Um, and that was work that was largely um, guided by Holger Fröhlich, who was uh, at that time, or who still is, with uh, UCB Biopharma, but from the 1st of December on, he will work actually with me in, at Fraunhofer, so I'm, I'm really happy that uh, we get one of the best data scientists in the dementia field um, into our team. And he has, he has done a this sort of clustering approach, came up uh, with a couple of interesting clusters, and I would be really interested to compare that to the lists of uh, adapted. It's one thing we really should do right away, and also in the Fago context. Uh, by the way, all what I'm showing here, all these graph models and so on, are the underpinning of the Fago knowledge base. So we directly took the autonomy developments and all the work we did there, and ported it to the, uh, to, the, to the Fargo project. And now comes the, the key question, the key deliverable of uh, etionomy, which was, do we find strata? Do we, mm -hmm. I mean, we found clusters, if you, as you have seen, but can we validate them? Can we independently validate them? And uh, we could do that really so far only in Parkinson, because we had the complete Parkinson data sets, uh, but now uh, with APAT and other uh, data sets being made available, we probably can do it next year in, in Alzheimer as well. But what I show you now is just what we did in the Parkinsonism field. We selected five candidate mechanisms, four of them uh, being the PET molecules or the PET uh, working hypothesis of our clinical partners. They were working in mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, epigenetics of synuclein, neuroinflammation, and uh, uh, insulin pathway. Um, uh, we added a in silico predicted mechanism, which was stress-induced shared um, mechanism between Alzheimerism and Parkinsonism. This was an in silico predicted mechanism. And um, Jean-Christophe Corvol in, in Paris uh, at the ICM, they, they had two 
two Parkinson cohorts, uh, one of the, the discovery cohort, which is their own one uh, that they didn't bring to the project for a good reason initially, because they kept it separate so that we could not train on that one. We did in the autonomy project, we did an independent cohort in Parkinson, and that would be our replication or our testing cohort. And then we did this enrichment procedure through genetics, through um, functional impact scores, uh, EQTLs, and so on. Did the clustering again. This is non-negative matrix factorization works like this. You have a cluster on the patient side, you have a cluster on the mechanism side, and you have an association matrix that links the clusters to the uh, patient, uh, mechanism clusters to the patient clusters. It was done, uh, work done predominantly by Boris Labrador and Holger Fröhlich and those colleagues in France and Paris. And what you see here are the, is the clustering at the genetics association level for the mechanisms, so the similarity of the mechanisms with respect to the genetic polymorphism spectrum. And you have here the different, the different, uh, the different um, mechanisms and here their dissimilarity more or less. And you have the patients clustered based on their genetic similarity and dissimilarity. And then you have this association matrix. And now you see there's one strong signal here. And there's a weaker one there. But it's essentially two signals, one very strong, one weak. And this is actually mm. our in silico predicted uh, mechanism. It was none of the clinical partner predicted PET mechanisms, pathophysiology mechanisms that made the game, but uh, our comorbidity, stress induced comorbidity, which was much to the dismay of the clinical partners in the project, I have to say. <laughs> they were not amused about that. Um, and we could reproduce that in the independent cohort here. Um, we, we could actually see the same pattern. You see the same association matrices. So in two independent, different, independent uh, Parkinson um, cohorts, we could reproduce this sort of association. There's a stratum which is associated with this here. And this is the mechanism that we predicted. And it's purely driven by a combination of data and knowledge-driven approaches. And it's representing an interesting biology which is bringing a new aspect into the etiology of uh, neurodegeneration, which is stress and stress-induced um, signaling, um, very much linked to the corticotropin-releasing hormone and the corticotropin-releasing hormone receptors, and we have two of them, and, and genetics that is linked. There is actually inversion uh, in our genome. In some of us, we have an inversion in the, uh, where an entire part of that locus is, is inverted uh, and comes under a different control. That could influence your risk, we, we cannot say yet, but it's worth following up. And it's linking Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we have also uh, um, um, pharmacological evidences like the antalamine function and so on. Um, I have no time to go into any detail, but this is certainly something that we should follow up on. And with that, I summarize, and I hope I didn't consume too much time. Yeah. So, what I want you to take home is autonomy has generated the first version of a mechanism-based taxonomy or has paved the way and shown us how to establish this uh, mechanism-based taxonomy for Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism. We have laid the foundation. With uh, NeuroMSIC, we have generated the largest inventory of reusable, computable disease mechanisms, and this is free for Fargo, and this is actually used in Fargo now. Uh, Christian Ebeling, my team, is working with the Fargo data using exactly these um, knowledge graphs. Um, we have uh, generated something that I didn't talk about, but it's a, um, an attempt to break out of the clinical data silos by virtual cohorts. Uh, we virtualize clinical data and make them reusable in a better way. Um, and it's maybe a future topic for more collaboration between all the data owners in the, in the dementia field. We have developed a couple of strategies and new algorithms to associate mechanisms with biomarkers and progression in patient level data. And we do a lot of progression modeling now together with a lot of other partners and there's a community forming in Europe that 
tackles this specific uh, problem. And, uh, and we have done the first clinical validation uh, in a limited setup. I have to say we couldn't kill the entire problem, but I'm still very happy and grateful for all the people who helped. And this is the acknowledgement, you know, IMI, of course, for all the support, financial, and also Elisabetta in particular for, you know, staying with us. I mean, this was a difficult journey sometimes, uh, was, uh, you know, partners, partners dropping out and so on. So it was not trivial. Um, and I think uh, the management team, all the work package leaders and their staff and all the partners, of course, the other IMI projects we collaborated with, APAD, I mentioned, IMIF uh, is another one, and uh, I was also involved with ADAPTED, and we are still involved with uh, FAGO. Uh, particular thanks goes really to Simon Lovestone and the University of Oxford, because they helped us a great deal with the Adnormat stuff. And uh, finally, all the patients, you know, never forget, there were patients who donated CSF, who donated blood, who uh, were coming back for uh, visits and who give us the data uh, that we need so urgently. Okay, thanks.